This is the biggest daytime tornado I've seen. Severe weather season is right around the corner, and after a somewhat active winter, mainly focused with just a few bouts of strong severe weather, we are heading to spring, and of course, that is when things really get going after a very active 2024. What will 2025 have in store? I'm meteorologist Nick Stewart, and let's take a look at the forecast going forward. Just some caveats going forward. This is going to be looking at several analogs, uh, several analog years, doing some reanalysis and kind of showing what the severe weather season might have in store. A quick look at the verification. We've been doing this a few different times now. Here is what the verification was for winter 2024-2025. I do want to note um, kind of a few different things. One was kind of the quieter mid-Mississippi River Valley region, much of Arkansas into eastern Texas as well. Uh, the analog years in the bottom left that I chose kind of hinted at that, and that's kind of what we saw uh, this 2024-2025 season. This is valid through February 21st, so there's always potential this could change, but I think in the next seven days, things look pretty quiet through much of the United States. Uh, we did also pick up kind of on that heightened activity across Dixie Alley, and again, this is not just number of tornadoes, but compared to normal. And one thing that our analog showed, kind of that bottom left graphic again, is kind of more so a spread out across Dixie Alley. That did kind of pan out, although there were kind of some minimums, most notably in Florida, as well as Georgia. Two areas that really didn't see a lot of tornadoes that the analog years were kind of hinting at. Looking back at the surface temperatures for the winter verification of 24 and 25 for the winter season, the Climate Prediction Center there, you can kind of see, was forecasting a pretty big warm spell across the eastern U.S. and mid-Atlantic region, while last year I was talking about more of a colder signal across the upper Midwest and mid-Atlantic and northeast United States. I actually kind of gambled with this a little bit. I invested into some futures for natural gas, and that became pretty lucrative because if you look at how things actually verified, uh, things were on the cooler side of things uh, for the most part um, across the eastern United states and northeast region of the united states where the cpc may have been a little bit on the slower side of things to respond to that so just kind of a case in which um you know using some of these analogs might be able to give you a bit of a leg up or an advantage so the big hot button thing going into spring 2025 is of course the enzo cycle it does appear that la nina will be starting things off but we'll be trending likely towards more neutral conditions that's kind of likely the forecast going forward and that is what will like be a pretty big driving factor uh, that's really evident in what the climate prediction center is showing so when you look at the analog years the years i am picking 1989 1996 2006, 2009, and 2018. Part of my um, process for picking years, I do try and pick years within the last about 30 to 40 years. I try to focus a little bit more on more recent trends just because the climate is changing. Um, so looking at just the Enzo cycle, we're sitting at about minus 0.4 in that uh, El Nino uh, 3.2 region. 1989 was minus 1.4. 96, 2006, and 2009 were all at minus 0 0.08. So a bit of a stronger La Nina. 89, of course, again, that 1.4 below and then 2018 was at minus 0.9 so the analog years were a bit stronger uh, than this current year uh, but one thing that I really kind of want to look at is what the March April May forecast kind of looks like uh, we're going to be trending towards about 0.3 minus 0.3 which is more in line which most of the analog years were kind of indicating minus 0 0.8, minus 0 0.4, minus 0 0.4, minus 0 0.3, minus 0 0.5. And the other thing too is that all the analog years were trending upwards, so trending towards neutral with time, kind of what we are looking at for 2025 as well. I like looking at the PNA. I think that does have a pretty big impact. That is one of the teleconnections I like to use for forecasting trends in weather. Uh, we did have a yes for PNA for 1989, 1996, 2006, 2009, and 2018 for a negative value in March to kind of kick off that severe weather season. And when you overlap that negative PNA with the negative PDO, uh, we are forecasting it this year. Uh, we did have a similar trend for 89, 2009, and 2018. Not so much the case in 96 and 2006. So just something to keep in mind with the analogs that I'm choosing. Uh, the other thing I do want to also keep in mind too is um, the um, Great Lakes. The Great Lakes, uh, the ice coverage there. 
we're going to be trending pretty close to normal. In fact, we will likely be pushing above normal in the next week or two to round out February and early March. Uh, 1989, 1996... Uh, you can see 2009 and 2018 were all above normal for ice coverage in the Great Lakes, most notably Lake Michigan, Huron, and Erie. That's really what I'm focused in on. The outlier here was 2006. That was a bit of a weirder year uh, for Great Lakes ice coverage. Just something to kind of keep in mind. One thing I want to note with the PDO, um, when you enter a colder PDO phase, which we are clearly in, you can kind of see the bottom graphic there. The Enzo cycle tends to be a bit of a stronger signal, so the correlation coefficient is closer to the 1 or minus 1 when looking at Enzo compared to PDO. However, when you have a negative PDO and a negative PNA, those tend to be kind of constructively interfered. Uh, you kind of see some constructive interference with them and could kind of make that pattern a bit stronger. And so that's why I'm looking at the PDO and PNA because they will both be in the negative phase. And what that means is you kind of get more Western troughing in the Western Conus, a little bit more ridging here in the Eastern US. You can kind of see this storm track kind of setting up here, right? <laughs> across like the Ohio River Valley towards the central Mississippi River Valley. You can also see that in the precipitation values. Um, those values on blue are above normal uh, precipitation. And you can kind of see that there across kind of that same region. Here's the official forecast from the Climate Prediction Center. Uh, very La Nina-esque. Uh, you can see the above normal precipitation for the Great Lakes. Big below normal chance for precipitation across the Four Corners region and... A lot of those central plains, and I think the central plains, they had a very active 2024. 2025, that might not be so much the case. So that's just one thing that I'm kind of watching at going forward. You can really see that trend here for below normal chances across the central plains. Also, Florida uh, may have a bit of an inactive season as well. Looking at the precipitation anomalies uh, from our analog years compared to the CPC, uh, you can see there are some similarities here. Kind of the above normal around the Great Lakes region, the below normal there across the Four Corners and much of the Central Plains. Kind of some above normalness here across the uh, Pacific Northwest as well. Um, so overall, the Climate Prediction Center outlook is kind of similar to some of the analog years I'm looking at, which again is not too surprising given I'm starting off in La Nina and heading kind of more towards a neutral state. And I do think the Great Lakes ice coverage is something that could have a pretty big impact, especially on uh, states like Indiana, Ohio, Illinois. Um, when you have more Great Lakes ice, um, that can kind of create a situation where those warm fronts, they can't surge as far north. When you get that strong northeast wind out the Great Lakes, that can kind of suppress how far northward those warm fronts can get. And so that's why I think the Great Lakes ice coverage is something that is worth looking at when producing a tornado outlook for springtime, especially March and April. May things begin to break down a little bit more, but um, you know, just something to keep in mind there. Uh, but you can see again in four of the five analog years, we were trending above normal for Great Lakes ice. And that top right graphic there uh, showing you that we were starting to trend likely above normal for ice coverage uh we are right near the climatological peak of that period right around this time so that's kind of what we're looking at there so when looking at the uh, spring analogs um here's kind of what we're looking at the uh bottom left graphic uh that is looking at your overall precipitation this is march april and may with the analog years and again pretty reflective dry central united states dry central plains kind of upper midwest as well with a more active period there across the uh, eastern united states so that's one thing we're watching here kind of a more active ohio river valley maybe central mississippi river valley also kind of dixie alley kind of getting a bit highlighted here uh looking at the 500 millibar pattern you can kind of see those positive anomalies here um, that's kind of more ridging going on right here which would not really be favorable for severe weather so that is one thing that we're closely watching there um, and it's also kind of reflected pretty well in the overall surface temperature anomalies. You kind of see some cooler trends here across much of the northern tier and eastern portions of the United States. Looking at um, the anomalies here for surface wind vectors, um, we're looking at the surface wind vectors here. This is March to May, and this is just May in the bottom left. Uh, a few things I want to point out here. Um, you can kind of see, especially in May, you do have a pretty stronger signal here for southerly 
uh, flow, that wind vector fields at the surface coming up across the great state of Texas. Uh, this could, in theory, be pushing more moisture northwestward. And you can kind of see that too with the uh, the cape, the instability anomalies. You kind of see some higher anomalies here across portions of West Texas and really across the you know Ohio River Valley and Southeast United States. So just something to keep in mind there. Um, I do think when you're factoring in stronger southerly winds across the Southern Plains, and of course we're talking about warmer than normal waters in the westernmost basin of the Atlantic Ocean, uh, that's where I do think you can start talking about higher instability, better moisture supply. So that could be a pretty big factor going forward. Uh, just May on its own. And we're looking at 850, uh, oop. And we're looking at 850 millibar uh, wind vectors here. You can kind of see that stronger anomaly here, potentially bringing in again, stronger and more robust moisture from the westernmost basin of the Atlantic Ocean, uh, bringing in some higher than normal precipitation up there, the moisture levels, right? That could be a favorable trend, especially for West Texas. West Texas dry lines uh, could be a benefactor of that. And again, you can kind of see that too in the instability in just May on its own. Some stronger instability there in Western Texas, but really below normal anomalous uh, instability levels there across the northern and central plains. So I think West Texas might be an area to watch as we head towards May specifically, but again, it's not really a forecast. It's kind of an outlook of how things may trend. So when looking at just the tornado reports, um, we're going to look at the analog years. Again, looking at the years I'm picking out compared to normal. So it's kind of a normalized tornado anomaly based on the period of each analog year. So this uh, tries to help filter out the fact that more recent years, you get better detection of tornadoes, better satellite surveys of tornadoes. You're gonna find more tornadoes with better technology compared to the old. And so this kind of helps normalize those anomalies. So with that said, let's take a look at some tornado anomalies. Here is the spring 2025 anomaly map using the analog years I've picked. Again, that's 1989, 1996, 2006, 2009, and 2018. Um, I would say one thing that really stands out right away is that Illinois region, central Illinois into eastern Missouri. This area really stands out to me as a potential area to watch as we head towards the springtime. I think this is in part, again, due to the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes ice coverage is a bit higher than normal. It's forecast to be higher than normal, and that's pretty similar to many of the analog years. So you kind of get that northeast wind coming off the Great Lakes that can kind of keep those warm fronts a bit farther south. And I think that could potentially be what we're seeing here. The other thing that really stands out here is kind of that western Kansas, much of Oklahoma, and kind of northern Texas. You kind of see this big negative anomaly here. That, I think, is also pretty interesting to look at uh, going forward. You know, we had a very active 2024, but that might change into 2025. So we'll have to really kind of see how that plays out. But I think those are the two big takeaways. They're kind of a more hyperactive uh, central Mississippi River Valley region, as well as a really inactive western and southern plains region. Otherwise, you can kind of see some kind of increased activity in the southeast United States. Dixie Alley might come alive, especially Alabama and South Carolina and Louisiana. We can kind of see this positive trend here. Um, the only other takeaway, too, I think is Iowa, kind of below normal. They had a really hyperactive season in 2024 that might get kind of shut down as well. The last thing I want to point out here is you kind of see some oddities here. We got some kind of really anomalously low and then a really anomalously high. I think what we're looking at here is potentially those West Texas dry lines, especially in May. I think that might be having some impact here because uh, supercells, you'll be more discreet. I think that's something we're watching um, in this area right here. Uh, here are your analog years again, 89, 96, 2006, 2009, 2018. Um, you can kind of see against kind of some hyperactive, uh, you know, years here across Illinois, uh, 2006, especially, uh, 1996, you had some activity in 2009 as well. So again, uh, just kind of rounding out this video, not necessarily a forecast. I wouldn't take this per se as to, a, you know, fact, but this is just kind of a look at the analogs, kind of a thing that I've been looking at just to kind of get some trends going forward. Uh, so just something to watch as we head towards spring 2025, might be a few 
few different active regions. I do think, though, just based on the analogs, it could be a pretty different year compared to 2024, um, especially in the area uh, that we might be watching for severe weather. I do hope you found this video rather interesting. Uh, we'll be kind of following this severe weather season. I'll be doing live storm chasing right here on YouTube. Uh, you can also follow me over on X and Facebook and all those other social media pages, all linked down in the video description below. If you did find this video interesting, please give it a like. It really does help me out. It helps more people find this video as well. And uh, feel free to subscribe if you're new to the channel as well. Again, we've been doing these kind of for every season kind of look back for the winter uh, season I did just kind of an idea of just kind of how things go um, but I do think these are kind of interesting I like doing kind of looks at climatology thanks for watching everybody have a great one and we'll see you again with the next video tornadoes are produced because of one thing instability enjoy <laughs>